by video or uh, remote video conferencing. At Clockmas Fire, our slogan is here for you. What does that mean? We value our people and people we serve. Our focus is establishing teams. Stands for trust, empowerment, accountability, mindset, and service. Our regular session come to order per ORS 192.610 to 192.690. ORS 192.650, the meeting is being recorded. Chief Brown, is there any changes to the agenda? Uh, no, sir. Agenda's as stands. Okay. Does any board member have any comments or changes to share about the ag agenda, the minutes? Okay. Hearing none, the minutes from the regular board meeting stand approved as written. Public comment, Ariel. Do we have anybody signed in for uh, public comment? We did not. Okay. Presentation Citizens Life Saving Award, Chief Brown. Awesome. Thank you so much, Errol. Can we get uh, uh, John Serta over? Yep, right, he is on as a panelist. Perfect. Trying to see if I don't see him on here yet. Okay, well, uh, members of the board, appreciate the opportunity that I get to uh, talk. As as everybody knows, I was gone last last month, and uh, the organization pre uh, presented uh, John Serta with the a community uh, a citizens life saving award. But I just wanted to take a second to uh, to to just recognize him again and tell him how. Uh, grateful that I am uh, for for the efforts that he made. It truly shows, uh, John, you're never off duty, right? And uh, and working, and then to be able to use the skills that you've learned over um, the years of being a firefighter uh, to to save somebody's life off off of uh, wearing the uniform is just absolutely amazing. And and so uh, for for the members that weren't listening uh, last month. Uh, John uh, was at work and one of his co-workers uh, had an accident and through the quick act action from uh, Mr. Serta, he, he put on a, a makeshift tourniquet and saved the individual's life. Um, and with that, John, uh, we understand that uh, we didn't give you an opportunity last month to, to, uh, to speak and it would be honored if you would uh, be able to, to share some thoughts and, and just turn the time over to you now. You're muted, John. Is that okay? Can Perfect, buddy. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Chief Brown and uh, Board of Directors and Clackamas Fire District 1. Um, it's an honor to, to receive this life, Citizen Life Saving Award. And uh, on behalf of Jeremy's family and Costco, uh, I'd like to thank Clackamas uh, Station 1 and AMR for the excellent care that they provided and the quick response. Um, I'd also like to thank a few coworkers that, you know, I share this with because, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty crazy when, when things happen, people stand up and, and, you know, your team is there and that's what I had. I had a great team and I'd like to thank, uh, Amy Bowden. Uh, she was uh, assisting Jeremy with his care. She just basically held on to him and, and let him do his thing and, and let him know that he was okay. And, you know, it's okay to do that. Um, on the special side of this, you know, Ben Silverman, Mark Eckroth, and Huey Harath, uh, you know, those guys were the ones that were coordinating the forklifts. Uh, Jeremy's leg was pinned, so it was, it was still on there. And I, I couldn't imagine if, if we had left the forklift on there, how much longer it would have taken. And so uh, I kind of asked them, hey, I need you here, and I need you here. And I had another guy, Ben, he was coordinating with the guys up top, and I was telling them how high they need to lift it. The forklift and so they responded without hesitation and that's just amazing and uh, we lifted the forklift uh, but prior to that i made sure that we had the tourniquet on <clears throat> and uh 
and held it tight. And so Amy and I pulled Jeremy out um, from that. And uh, we were just able to be there for Jeremy and, and, and hold that tourniquet tight until paramedics arrived. You know, at the time, it seems like it's a long time, but really it was fast. They were there quickly and um, we were able to get him going. I think it was like 15 minutes from the time of the tourniquet, less than that, that we were able to actually get him in the back of the ambulance and get going. Um, and so it was just amazing how everybody came together. Um, and some of the managers, uh, Star Stefani, Dave Higgs, and Daryl Sinclair, those guys were the ones who were supporting his family when he was in the hospital for over 80 days, uh, providing food for their family, doing some house chores and stuff like that, and, and just support, giving Jeremy support and being communication. So um, it was a very scary moment. It uh, changed the way we think about our jobs and, and the way we do things day to day. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, John. You know, um, when I, I don't know if this was shared last last month, but John, 20 years ago, John, uh, 20, 18 years ago, was was with Clackamas Fire Family um, yeah. as, as a volunteer and and uh, now is with Gladstone and um, and then obviously wow. Costco. Um, but we just appreciate what you did and and your quick action, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Chief. <clears throat> Fire Marshal Sean Olson now will be presenting a question answers on proposed resolution 22-01. Uh, Mr. President, bef before Chief Olson starts, uh, <clears throat> I just wanted to add a little something ab sure. about the presentation, not only tonight and sure. and last time i think uh something that was sort of sort of not articulated was that the reason for the resolution is that we currently don't have a mechanism to charge for these services that some of the other agencies and some of the other cities are charging for and ultimately the the best outcome would be us to work with those agencies and get a portion of what they're already charging the folks but we just don't even have anything in place. So that's what the, the resolution is for, is to have something in place, but ultimately to work with those agencies through through the fire marshal's office to start recouping some of those costs through what they're already charging. But I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, Chief Olson. Steve, you have a question? Sure. Yeah, Steve. But I understand that they are all, the, the public is already charged this, but the counties and cities are benefiting but not sharing with us because even though we do the work, right? Yes, yeah, some of some of them are, yes. And so to have a resolution that allows us to charge, we 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 envision that we'll be able to approach them and start to work with them on the charges that they're already charging. But right now we're just doing the work for free. But so this is not nothing, anything new fee we are starting. It, well, it, it is it is a fee that we're starting, but we just have to have it memorialized in in this resolution to even say that we have a way to, okay. to charge for it. Okay, okay, okay. Um, you're going to Sean. Yes, Chief. Okay. Olson. Thanks, Chief Gears. I appreciate it, uh, Mr. President, members of the board. Thank you for your time and moment here to kind of further explain some of the questions that you guys had for me at the March 21st meeting. So I appreciate it. Um, and just to articulate further what Chief Dieters is mentioning um, and to go a little bit further with it, it would be called out specifically for the certain tasks that we do. So it's exactly what Chief Dieters is mentioning. So, uh, but this would allow us to specifically call out those fees for service. So, um, and I'll just, I think out of the formality with this, I'll just go over a couple of the questions that each of the member board members had for me, if that's okay. Um, and then kind of start with that. So, and follow it up with any additional questions that you may have. Uh, so just briefly, um, looking over my notes, um, Chief or Director Hawes, you had mentioned something about RRS 478.310. And in my comments said, I think I thought that we were able to collect fees for service in unprotected areas, and we for sure are. So it would be included within those boundaries uh, that we do not provide service or it's unprotected according to ORS. So um, do you have any further questions on that? Okay, thank you. And Director Wall, um, 
I wanted to, I had some homework to do. Uh, so regarding the public notifications, and I still do have further homework in that, but what I did immediately was establish a Q&A document, kind of wrapping through my head of what would the questions be asked of Clackamas Fire as to why we're collecting these fees. I provided those Q&A uh, sheets to our public affairs group. We published that on our public website, also through social media and those aspects of it. Um, one thing I still need to establish pending this approval is between now and July 1st is reaching out to our public that may not use computers or may not have public website access. Um, my plan to that, to address that is to provide a similar document, if not the same document to our local jurisdictions um, that they can hand out with their applications when people come in for either pre-applications, building permits, um, so I do have a means to be able to speak to our, our rural communities who may not use uh, social media. Um, so, and other avenues too can be either through informational uh, boards at the county lobbies. Um, there's means that we can do that can address that. So, um, and director, did you have any more questions with that? Any directors have any questions? Marilyn, you are muted. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm using a different computer than I used to, and so I'm not sure. familiar with it. My apologies. Uh, yes, uh, Chief Olson, I'm, uh, you know, to me, this is just this is a twofold ordinance. The uh, basic ordinance, the first one that you're amending, deals with fees um, related to people who are not complying with the fire code. And we warn them and they don't do it. And I actually thought that the proposal was too um, in favor of the people who aren't doing the right thing and it should have been more harsh. And why should we have to go back four times before something happens? I mean, we don't do this for our uh, health and well-being is because it's an important um, safety feature. The second part of your ordinance enacts new fees. And, and while I'm not going to disagree that probably the county and the maybe cities all have these, um, the fact, my concern at that time was um, the outreach to the public. The first category are fireworks and that's fine i mean they probably expect to have some but i'm really concerned about the final category of fees that we're beginning to impose that are brand new and those are the ones on the little festivals people who are putting up tents um, and things of that nature that i think that there might be a public relations issue there and it looks like we're just joining in as you say well, everybody else assesses fees, so why don't we too? Well, that's not a good enough reason to do it. So um, I guess I was kind of looking for, uh, I have no, absolutely no objection to increasing the penalties or the fees to uh, the people who are not complying with your inspections. That's, you know, they, they can't do that. But I think um, that the other, and the fireworks, it's, you know, it's, Again, it's, to me, it's not sufficient to say, well, everybody else does it, so why don't we? That's just not a good enough reason. But um, so I'd like to know why, other than the fact that everybody else does it, what's a good reason to tell the constituents why we need to have these fees? Well, one of the, the bigger part to that, and not saying, well, everybody else is doing it, you know, it's, it's a big part of the what it costs for doing service and the things that we've done, um, especially with the raised cost for materials and services. And ultimately that's really truly the big part of this as to why we're doing it is to try to help out with a little bit of revenue for the district and to help offset some of those costs. Um, and to do so, I, I wanna be very mindful about how we do that. And I fully understand, and I was gonna to speak to uh, Director Searing too regarding the festivals and events. and. Um, took away some good key points with the conversations that we had at the last board meeting. And we made some adjustments there, which I think would be more beneficial. Um, and one of those adjustments is we've increased it to a thousand, proposed a thousand citizens for that event to include 
the possibility of either wave, waiving those fees or driving them to a direction of providing an emergency plan, which most of these facilities that, for example, Happy Valley Fireworks, which is coming up, we know that draws a huge crowd, but they already, already have an emergency plan in place, which they do internally, and they have us review it. So excellent. We're not going to charge you guys a fee for that. You know, and they also with the intent with that is there's certain festivals that come up due to COVID that have been canceled. Um, there was a festival coming up called the Vortex 2020 or 2020. Yeah, um, but that was canceled. So we might see that again. But that would be an instance where, OK, we need to get further deep into this because crowds are going to be 30 to 40,000. So that's where we would really go in depth and spend a lot of our staff time um, and conducting these reviews. So I think how it's written now, it provides us that leniency um, and being considerate with the nonprofits, which fully understand. And with our own festivals, our own annual safety fairs, like, are we gonna charge ourselves? Like, well, no, um, but taking to that consideration. Um, so I think my approach with this and our approach with this is really just to, just to try to offset some of the costs. And you're gonna, I hear and I talk to a lot of people at the state level, a lot of jurisdictions are moving towards this direction, um, but it also provides a better and higher level of service for fire and life safety, uh, especially outside of hours. Um, so that's kind of been our approach with it. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, President Jim. Thomas, I just had one more. Yeah, go ahead, Sean. Okay. Um, I think Director Searing, I, I was gonna bring this up to you regarding the festival events. Um, and so I, I appreciate your comments that you had at the last meeting and we did take into consideration. I think that would be uh, very beneficial to this, but it, it would also address and what we're really trying to do is capture the, our, our big events uh, that when they occur. So I, if you're okay with that, with what I was mentioning, do um, you have any further questions on that? Um, well, uh, when I look at the list, haunted houses, that makes sense. They're technical, there's inspections you have to do for those, the explosive and blasting, yep. Fireworks, yep. Fireworks displays, yep. Fire safety during construction, yep. I don't know, it's just events and festivals in general. Um, most of the large events and festivals are put on by our cities. You got the Milwaukee days, Happy Valley uh, concerts in the park, the Oregon City Pioneer Days, Gladstone has the Chautauqua Festival, I think they used to call it, you know, so I just don't, I don't know, I don't uh, understand why we would even need to have that on the list, because we've been in COVID for two years, and we're encouraging our communities to get back out together, and we're going to charge 180 bucks, to me, it doesn't make sense, but if, if, my colleagues would support it. No, I'm not gonna vote no on this, uh, but I, it just seems like uh, we don't need, even for crowds over a thousand people, it just doesn't seem like it makes sense to me, but that's just me. But I like everything else. I think you did a good job on the rest of it and I'd support it. Jim, I yeah. think if, uh, Sean, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I understand that as long as the cities who are assembling the festivals or uh, activities, if they have the emergency plan in place, we are waiving that fee. That falls with the city oh. of Milwaukee, Oregon City, Happy Valley. That all falls into that category because the cities have an emergency plan in place. So that will make them exempt. Am I correct, Sean? Correct. Yeah. Okay. And and this, this may be something, it's just there. It's there if we need it, uh, especially uh, for Vortex. If Vortex 2024 comes or 2023, um, uh, that's a huge event for us. But where, where do we get tickets? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going off duty. <laughs> okay. I was wishing it was coming for 2020, but then it canceled. I'm like, so. Okay. Chris has a question. Okay, thank you. That makes I guess just more a comment. I guess that's, uh, when, when we were talking about that, I was thinking about the pickathon. Yeah, exactly. 
you know, uh, yeah, I mean, I can see if it's a little uh, day in Damascus, Jim, something like that, you know, work with them, wave it, you know, help them come up with a safety plan. I'm sure we could come up with a fairly generic one that they could work with. But this, this to me seems it gives us the flexibility that if the situation warrants it, the staff could charge a fee where right now they don't have any flexibility at all. They just can't. Yeah, correct. Yeah, Good. it's just an opportunity if we need to use it. Yeah, um, exactly. So, so that all makes sense. I'm totally on board. Thank you. Okay. Good. Good. But uh, any other board members have any questions or comments anymore? Okay. Well, thanks, now, thanks for the additional info, Sean. I appreciate it. Okay. Well, you. you know, officially, this is a second reading of the resolution 22 dash zero one. That is the resolution amending the ordinance 18 dash one adding fire marshal's office plan review fees and establishing a flat rate fees for the construction and operation permits. Sean, is there additional comments or anything to share? I don't have any at the time. So thank you. Steve, I Steve do you have anything to add? Okay. Do you, I hear a motion from the board to approve the resolution 22-01? So moved, Jay. Jay, second, Chris. Chris seconded. Ariel, please roll call the roll. Marilyn? Yes. Jay? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Chris? Yes. Jim? Uh, yes. The motion passed unanimously. Thank you and good work, Sean. Good work. I think it's time we move it to be a little bit more effective and all the hard work we do get rewarded. The board, uh, board appointment of a budget committee member, Chief Financial Officer Mark Whitaker. Okay, good evening, everybody. This should be um, fairly quick. So I just, uh, we have an, an item here to reappoint um, Charles Gallia as uh, the, the fifth budget committee member. Um, I believe he's he's been doing it at least one term already and has been a... a <coughs> Great member of the committee offers offers good insight, so I just propose that we uh, reappoint him. Any comments from the board, Jay? Yeah, the only comment I'm, I'm, I hope he doesn't take this wrong because I have no problem with him being on the budget committee. But I just want to make sure: are we do we we're not missing a process here? We're we're not required or expected to do any kind of process here. We can just um, shoulder tap somebody and say, "Do you want to be on the board?" Um, I do want to be clear. We did we did advertise for this position, um, yes. so we yes. we put, posted it on social media. We did have it on our on our website, um, and uh, we had we only had one qualified applicant, and that was and that was Charles. Uh, we, did have, okay. we did have some other interests, but one was from the city of Gladstone, and the other one was, I believe, um, also not a, a, vo a registered voter in the district, so they were kind of disqualified. Okay. Um, so it seemed appropriate to to reappoint Charles. Okay, great, super. I just want to make sure we're not circumventing any kind of process we're supposed to do. But well, thank you, Bert, thank you for that. Yeah, we not only advertised uh, directly from the fire district, but also I saw Sun Glow has advertised in the LinkedIn, uh, sharing our advertisement. So I have seen that myself. Uh, do I hear a motion for the board to appoint Charles Gallia to a three-year term on the budget committee? I so moved. Jim moved. Jay, Jay seconded. Jay seconds. Jay seconds. Ariel? Jay? Yes. Chris? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Jim? Yes. Marilyn? Yes. The motion passed unanimously. Thank you, the board. Uh, the request for the board approval of Gladstone IGA and Exhibit A, the Employee Transfer Agreement, uh, Chief Brown. Thank you so much, Thomas. I appreciate uh, you bringing this uh, forward. Uh, before I pass it over to Brian, just want to give a little bit of, of uh, background and uh, welcome uh, Chief Rick Huffman and City Administrator Jackie Betts uh, to us. They're, they just got on the camera. Thank you guys for being here. Um, a lot of work uh, and collaboration uh, has has is being brought before you today that's really started um, last May when I became fire chief and the direction from this board was to look at uh, a lot of our mutual aid 
uh, uh, situations that we were having with neighboring jurisdictions, if you remember. Um, Chief Huffman uh, just so happened at the time to uh, be going through uh, some operational concerns as far as deployment in the city of Gladstone. And it, it sparked a really good conversation between the, the two of us as, of how we could bring forward a better regional care to not only citizens of Gladstone, but to our citizens as well. So I uh, really appreciate the collaboration with uh, City Administrator Betts, uh, Chief Huffman, uh, and Chief Brian Stewart. A lot of hours put into what we're bringing before you today. And I'm excited about this opportunity of collaboration uh, with the city and, uh, and with Administrator Betts. And so with that, I'll turn it over to, to Chief Stewart. Uh, thank you, Chief Brown. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, as the chief introduced, this has been uh, about a year in, in the making since that initial conversation. We had some opportunity to provide services with Gladstone before that. Uh, we've been providing fleet services for them for a period of time. And uh, then beginning of last year, we started providing fire prevention services, fire investigation services, uh, and then also doing some administrative work for them as well. But this is a, this is a, uh, a relationship that has been uh, growing over years. And I think that goes back to a lot of the, the perspective that uh, Director Searing shared uh, during interagency committee meetings. Uh, that, that goes back to the uh, information that was shared by Chief Huffman, uh, looking back at the 2010 uh, feasibility study and their 2017 uh, standards of cover. And just the relationship that um, each agency has in providing service across the borders to each other. Certainly Gladstone, receives more services from us uh, than we receive from Gladstone. But what that really shows is with as much as goes back and forth, how interoperable we need to be to provide the best service to our customers and for Glad the city of Gladstone to provide the best service to their customers. Um, and we hope that we expect that this uh, interagency agreement will do that. Just a few pieces on the timeline and uh, high points of the agreement here. So while the conversation started, uh, internally about the mutual aid uh, discrepancies between not just Gladstone and Clackamas Fire, but other agencies uh, across the, the county with us. Uh, in September, we really started having some discussions with the council as uh, Chief Huffman and City Administrator Betts asked uh, for some direction. We're having their, they were having some challenges and they asked their, their council for some direction, just as, as we ask our board for direction uh, when we look for that policy work. Uh, so the city held a work session on September 28th, and that was promptly followed up uh, with a interagency committee meeting in early October. Uh, again, that was the foundation of, of some of the conversations um, and just the relationship between our elected officials, which is a key and instrumental part to uh, the relationship, not just developing this agreement, but how we see the agreement being um, supported uh, and evaluated as, as it's implemented. Uh, in late February, they held a special session on fire emergency services. Uh, the fire chief provided a, a detailed uh, informational session on the status of what they could provide and where uh, they were not meeting their, their standards of cover requirements. Uh, at that end of that session, the city then directed staff to prepare a contract for service for the council's consideration. Uh, staff on both sides worked diligently, um, as you can imagine. Uh, we, uh, while this is largely based on prior IGAs from our side, uh, we still wanted to make sure that we had eyes on it from facilities and support services uh, <laughs> to make sure that it was relevant and timely for this, this agreement. Uh, so over the course of uh, a month and a half, uh, both sides worked diligently on the contract and Internally, we brought that to uh, our interagency committee for review on April 5th. The interagency committee had received it a, a little bit before to uh, be able to review it and have some discussions. Uh, and it had also been reviewed by legal um, and has been uh, reviewed and discussed by legal since then. Uh, and then on April 12th, uh, after getting support from our committee to move forward, uh, we presented it to Gladstone. And at that point, uh, they again presented a compelling uh, background on the, the, the process. Um, their council had some good conversation, had some discussion, uh, questions about um, employees um, and uh, the history 
uh, and legacy of their, their service and their fire department. Um, I think our board understands as we're an aggregate uh, agency, what a great job our members do of preserving that, that heritage. Um, if you haven't seen the, the remodel at station 18, uh, when I went in there and it was shortly, after it was shortly completed, it was neat to see that uh, Captain Lay uh, had found some of the old boring uh, pieces out there like squad 148 and had been saying, hanging signs up. Uh, so uh, we do take pride in that and I think they'll see that under the service agreement. So they approved the agreement uh, is now up to uh, this board to see if they want to uh, continue to execute it. Uh, key aspects of this agreement. So this is a, uh, it's a five year agreement, but it's, it's broken into three sections, uh, a, a one year initial term, and then two, two automatic renewal terms, uh, each of 24 months. The initial term begins uh, July 1st of 2022. Uh, in the event that Gladstone is unable to maintain staffing between now and July 1, uh, they were looking for some assurances that services could be provided. So we did build in a daily rate, uh, which could uh, allow them to uh, receive services starting June 1st. And I believe that is currently our target date to actually start service. Clackamas would be staffing the Gladstone Fire Station 24-7, 365 with three firefighters uh, with our minimum of at least one being a paramedic. And our other services, including uh, fire engineering, prevention, community risk reduction, community engagement, um, emergency management, the list goes on. All of those would be commensurate with Clackamas fire practices. And I think one of the two pieces about uh, this and the prior, again, speaks to working across borders and making the operations more seamless. Um, for example, uh, while very closely aligned, we have our command system. Gladstone had been using blue card. Slight variations, but those are going away. Um, the, the differences of, are they staffed with two people on a squad or three people on a fire engine goes away. The equipment's the same, the SCBAs are the same. Um, so it's standardizing that um, across the board, which makes all of our, should make all of our services uh, more efficient and streamlined and safer for both the community members and our firefighters. Um, as we bring the firefighters over, uh, the career employees experience and qualifications will be evaluated uh, and the employees will be assigned uh, appropriately. And then paid on call firefighters uh, that are in good standing uh, will be offered volunteer positions with us. Uh, we don't have a paid on call or part-time firefighter uh, program. So those individuals uh, will be able to come over as volunteers if they're in good standing. And then we also continue uh, to evaluate the performance uh, by establishing a joint oversight review committee uh, with the recommendation to meet monthly for the first six months and then quarterly thereafter. In terms of budget, uh, the budget implications, uh, this is a uh, cost neutral piece for the city of Glasgow and really for us, it is, uh, bringing in $2.15 million of revenue, um, which is about $300,000 more uh, than the, the really the direct expenditures, the fuel, the personnel, the utilities that we'll be spending at uh, that fire station. So that $300,000 helps absorb the costs of overhead of the fire chief's time, of training's time, of the fleet mechanics time, uh, of my time, of, of all those pieces that are required to run a fire district. And that revenue will continue to uh, increase at Gladstone's AV uh, annually. Um, <clears throat> they're also uh, transferring the ownership of their frontline engine. Uh, and this is a uh, kind of a bridge um, because the cost of our services uh, uh, is closely aligned with what's coming in. Uh, bringing the fire engine across can add some additional value. Um, but we are giving them the opportunity to purchase that should the contract terminate uh, ahead of time. For example, in the board packet, if the contract ended on July 1st, 2025, they would be able to purchase the engine at $350,000, which is the depreciated value of the engine at that point. And it would be prorated based on wherever the contract ended. So the potential issues for this, um, we've been through uh, a number of these. And there are a uh, few um, problems that we see um, coming into the implementation or being successful once it's implemented. 
the uh, the challenges that we uh, could face would be when we uh, should we should the city of Gladstone step away from the agreement uh, or or not renew uh, the relationship, and that is transitioning back, helping them transition back to being Gladstone Fire, and helping us transitioning back to being Clackamas Fire with a different and new relationship with Gladstone, much like the interoperability piece that we are hoping to see increase. We want to see that maintain and certainly there's going to be work to do it to be associated with that. And then the other piece is while they have two FTEs that would be uh, line firefighters, we'd be adding seven and we would have a total of nine firefighters working at the fire station. <clears throat> if this contract terminates, we own those employees. The two that are coming from Gladstone would have the opportunity to go back to the city of Gladstone or the Gladstone Fire Department. And, and they may or may not elect to do that. But we wanted to have make sure that we had time to look at uh, attrition of our own employees, retirements, um, vacancies that are forthcoming, uh, promotions. And so a 12 month notice of termination gives us an opportunity to plan and to change our hiring path uh, to be able to absorb those employees uh, a little more readily. Brian, real quick, uh, yes, the three employees that would be coming over. Well, two of them, two of them will be coming over as firefighters out of that station. Or I see what you're, okay, I, I, yeah. I just want to make sure the board understands that three employees will be coming over. Yes, three employees will be coming over. The contract's terminated, um, but we have nine employees that are associated with that fire station that we would need to absorb. Yeah, thank you for the clarification. Um, and those are the high points of the, the agreement um, and what we see as the, the budget implications and potential issues. I'm happy to answer any questions for the board. Um, and Chris. I know Chief Huffman and City Minister also. I'm going to actually, Brian, after the board has any questions, then I will ask uh, Chief Huffman or Ms. Betts to make any comments they want. Thank you, Mr. President. Okay, Chris. A uh, <clears throat> couple of questions, Brian. First, in, in Section 3B, and I, I think a couple other places, it speaks of a station remodel. Is that is that remodel currently underway, or is that something that we're looking at undertaking to meet Appendix D, I think it was? Yeah, that's a great question, uh, Director Haas. So the remodel, I will say is not underway at the moment in terms of actual construction. The remodel had been posted uh, as an RFP, awarded, uh, bid and then awarded and their contractor backed out uh, a few months ago. Um, I believe they are looking at reposting it this, um, uh, maybe next week, I believe. And the current intent is that the city would maintain uh, project oversight uh, for that. Okay. Uh, my other one is in section 5H2, uh, and I think a couple other places, it, it mentions a possible 31 cents a thousand operating levy, basically. Is that is that in lieu of uh, the, the current payment in addition to, or what kind of, I, I, I kind of read through it and didn't have a chance to get back really in depth to figure out the, the where's and the how to fours. Oh, yeah, certainly. So they, uh, that 31 cents per thousand is currently part of what they provide uh, or how they fund their fire services. So they have a five-year levy that the, it's been renewed, uh, I believe, three times. It comes up for renewal in May of 23. Uh, and this was some language that allows them uh, and allows us to look at what happens if they are unsuccessful in passing a 31 cent levy and renewing that. Um, or should they change that amount? Um, it was really an option of, of looking at what does a different level of service look like, or if they need a different funding stream, or how can we how can we bridge that gap? Okay, perfect. That answered my question. Thanks, Brian. Appreciate it. Thanks, sir. Any anybody else? Chris, uh, Jay. You always call me Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yes, uh, maybe this is, uh, well, a couple of questions. Uh, what, uh, uh, Chief Huffman, is he, is he coming over and what is his new role going to be? 
obviously not fire chief. Uh, they, they Although he'd be a great one, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> he'd be a phenomenal one. He, he I think is Administrator Betts can back that. Uh, is he coming over as a firefighter, or, or how's he coming over? He, are, he, are you privy to answer that yet? I can tell you after the vote. Okay, gotcha. You know, until the vote, right? I mean, it, in in conversations uh, with with uh, with Chief Huffman. Um, the, the, the spot where it would be truly beneficial to, to the organization would be in the command staff. Um, but the exact spot I, you know, first thing we're worried about is getting this vote through and then we'll, and then we'll worry, worry about the, the placement of the employees. Okay. The second question I have, and uh, maybe this is, I, I may be completely off base here, but um, might be for uh, city administrator bets too. I understand that uh, the uh, city hall um, where the fire station is located is going to go away. There's going to be a library put in there or something like that in the not too distant future. Um, is that, am I right here or? Um... You're, you're, you're correct. Yeah, the, okay. the old city hall is being, will be demolished. Uh, they relocated the city hall um, up past uh, the high school okay. a couple of years ago. Is that going to have any impact on our firefighters? Is that something that we're looking at as, how that's going to impact our folks working out of that station or how they're going to access the road, those kind of things. That, that's a great question. It came up uh, during our interagency uh, committee uh, on, on the fifth or in some follow-up emails with that. Um, certainly we're going to be impacted by that. We, we recognize that it's uh, occurring. We're choosing to enter the agreement. Uh, we've spoken or I've spoken with legal on that topic. Um, and in terms of what the impacts are, uh, it's going to be loud and noisy. They're going to be next to a construction site during the day. Um, and hopefully this is a, uh, with the RFP and all the other processes that need to happen, hopefully it's a, a short turnaround because I imagine that over the first uh, several months, especially that our crews will be out getting familiar with uh, the FMZs, uh, getting familiar with the community, being out and about of, of the fire station. Uh, and I can only imagine that uh, having uh, construction equipment, uh, moving, breaking, lifting, uh, all that stuff uh, will, will help encourage them to be out about during the day. Um, but so the, are, they, uh, are their living conditions going to be similar to our folks' living conditions at Station 16 when that whole thing was happening up there too? Uh, <laughs> they're they're gonna they're gonna be uh, they're gonna be living uh, well. Their living conditions are a little different right now. They actually live in a, uh, they have a day room space and offices in the fire station in a, in a small apartment in the back. But the uh, the challenges of the access, much like station 16, uh, or at least when they were doing the road work, uh, that's a piece that uh, Sean Olson's division is gonna be involved with with the, with the engineering, the plan reviews uh, and making sure that that's uh, contained and uh, accommodated. Um, I've also spoken with city administrator Bess and I believe uh, the fire chief has on that topic of, um, this is a county project, it's not a city project for the library. Um, and so the, the city really doesn't- Am I, have am I, am I, Brian, am I the only one yeah. here you freezing the here? Yeah, you, is it my know. Wi-Fi or is it? It's your Wi-Fi, Thomas. Ah, okay. Here we go again. Um, yeah. To, to the extent possible, uh, Gladstone, the city of Gladstone has offered to, to assist us if we have a difficult time with the contractor or with the county in accommodating uh, our needs and our paths of travel or, or anything. Um, but again, it's a, uh, a, a, a county project uh, and, and we know that going in. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yes, Jim. Um, I didn't have any questions, but just a, a couple comments. Um, I wanted to uh, comment that our chief's group uh, and the Gladstone Chief Huffman and the city administrator, in my opinion, established a great working relationship. It was really nice to see them work with each other throughout this process, communicate. It seemed like it worked really, really well. So congratulations to all of you. Uh, I was invited by Chief Brown to attend the Gladstone Council meeting on April 12th. Uh, and thank you, Chief, for inviting me along. It brought back a lot of memories sitting there uh, watching that meeting. Uh, 
the Gladstone Council had a lot of really good comments. Uh, they were concerned for the transfer of their personnel and they should. And I think we'll do a great job following the law and the best that we can to accommodate uh, those uh, individuals, the same as we've always done. <clears throat> the decision was tough for some of those council members. Gladstone has a great history and should this be successful, it's important that we retain that history forever like we do um, and uh, ultimately the council voted five one ones five yes one no one abs abstained and to me that showed that no matter how difficult it was uh, they're looking out for the service of their community service above all else so to me um, this is a great strategic partnership it's a win-win for both districts. And clearly having that station staffed with 324-7 with the paramedic improves our effective response force, not only for Gladstone, but for all, all of our communities around it. It changes the standard of cover significantly. So in the end, uh, I'll be supporting it. And I, I think uh, hopefully we'll do a great job serving the Gladstone community the same as we do everywhere, just like they're part of us, so. Thank you, Jim. Mm -hmm. Chief, pa Chief Hoffman or uh, Ms. Betts, would you like to make a comment? You are mute. I think Jackie's saying no. Uh, she's the boss, so I'll let her go first, but. Um, oh, okay. Anything? I was just going to kind of summarize Director Searing's is that this was a very emotional decision and we care deeply about the Gladstone Fire Department, and we care deeply about the level of service we provide our citizens. But we trust Chief Brown's leadership during this transition and believe it's going to be an excellent opportunity to enhance fire and emergency services together. So we appreciate the collaboration. And I'll thank just, you. Uh, I'd like to echo that and I'd like to thank uh, the board of directors, uh, for their command staff, uh, Chief Brown and Chief Stewart have been phenomenal, and, and Chief Dieters uh, personally came out to talk with some of the personnel, which was really appreciated. And I just have to echo what Jackie said. The um, the personal emotional side of this is something I I actually didn't expect, and the the uh, commitment of the volunteers and the on call firefighters of the past. It's just something we can't we, we can't minimize and we can't really change the, the situation we're in. It's a really unfortunate that the job has, the service level has increased so much over the years and the last two years is ridiculous. And I think that what we're doing is the best for the public, but it's not always seen as, when the, when the big company comes for the buyout, nobody likes it. It doesn't matter how you package it. But I, I know from working with everybody here and, and the crews that the service level is going to be consistent, cost effective, and really good for the future. And I just wanted to say it out loud one more time and, and thank you. Thank you, Chief Hoffman. Uh, I also want to underline the amount of work and leadership Brian showed in this is just tremendous. Chief Brown, every time I have a discussion on the subject, he just uh, cannot say enough. And we are happy, Brian, you put all this and this coming into fruition. So with that, is there anybody else I want to make any comment? Chief I just one, one, one quick comment and then I'm Please. gonna shut my mouth. Um, the, the thing that's impressed me in, in, in being and watching our, our board meetings and a lot of comments from the board is, what's the community think? What's the community think? And the one thing that I will say um, about city administrator, that's fire chief Huffman, and really every single one of the council members is they reached out to their communities and they listened to their community and they got pulse of, of the community on what, what's best for the community. So um, I know that that's been a big thing for our board is what do the citizens of Gladstone want? And I believe what you are seeing being brought for before you today um, is exactly what uh, the city would like in the city, the citizens of Gladstone. So thank you. 
And I also want to applaud Nick for empowering and delegating this, uh, this whole process to Brian and you let him have the free reign. Uh, I, have, I have watched and seen behind the scenes, all the things that happen. So I appreciate that. With that, do I hear a motion for the board to approve the Gladstone IGA and exhibit A, the employee transfer agreement? I so move. Jim okay. Siren moved. Chris seconded. Ariel, please call the roll. Thomas? Yes. Chris? Yes. Jim? Uh, yes. Marilyn? Yes. Jay? Yes. But thank you very much. This is uh, well, Chief Huffman and Brian, your job now starts to getting these things done and we wish you all the best. The next item we have is the request board ratification of station 19 property annexation to Happy Valley. Chief Brown. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, I, I'm gonna bring this, uh, bring this forward and then I would have, ask that, uh, that uh, Director Searing offer a couple comments if that's okay with you, Thomas. Sure. Um, brought this forward to the executive committee um, uh, two about two weeks ago. And, um, and what you see before you is a, is a memo for ratification of, uh, from the board in the annexing of station 19, our property off Damascus Lane into Happy Valley. I have filled out an application and submitted it to the city of Happy Valley uh, for approval. Um, as you will see by the attachment, uh, station 19 is currently in unincorporated Clackamas County but is right up against the border of Happy Valley uh, with Damascus Lane being a cherry stem uh, uh, type of annexation, which would include Damascus Lane and the fire station. Um, station 19 sits within Happy Valley's, uh, Steve, I always say this wrong, UGMA. Did I say it right? UGMA, right? Urban Growth Management Area, which has been approved by uh, the city and the county. And when discussing this matter with the Interagency Committee, uh, which was uh, consisting of President uh, Joseph, Director Searing, and then also uh, Director Wall, who stood in uh, for, for uh, Thomas while he was gone. Um, I'm, I'm bringing forward um, to this board a recommendation to ratify this uh, application, which was submitted to Annex Station 19 into Happy Valley. And I'd be happy to answer any questions, uh, uh, but would love for Jim to offer any perspective here, please. Well, J Jim, would you make your comments before we ask for any other board members input? Oh, sure. Um, the, the staff report you put together, Chief, I thought was very informative. So thank you for doing that. Um, really, this uh, to me follows uh, the same decisions that previous boards have made. They, in the past, uh, several of our boards have uh, uh, stated Happy Valley is a strategic partner. And in some cases, we went way out of our way via cherry stems to annex station eight, especially the training center, the logistic building, uh, station five, uh, station six has always been in Happy Valley and then station seven. So uh, there's an opportunity now uh, with the Damascus incorporation uh, petition withdrawn uh, Happy Valley has opened annexations up again and stated uh, that, uh, that it's a good time to annex uh, with that petition withdrawn. So this uh, establishes that strategic partnership and keeps that with Happy Valley. Uh, it meets the Happy Valley annexation policy. One question Director Wall had was, uh, would the city annex that block of Damascus Lane? We checked and they said, yes, that uh, this is not a long cherry stem like we've done with several of our other properties. It's a short one. So Happy Valley did uh, state that they would, it meets their policy. As the chief mentioned, it is in the UGMA, the Urban Growth Management. So what that means is Clackamas County and the city of Happy Valley have already agreed in that UGMA zone if it's reachable and it meets Happy Valley's annexation policy, then it can be annexed. So uh, I think it meets all of those. It's free, doesn't cost anything. 
And uh, so I brought that forward uh, because I've been involved with numerous other annexations that are underway as we speak, and uh, including one property owner on Foster Road, just a couple houses up from Station 19, also submitted just this week. So there are a number of additional property owners, even in that area, that are annexing as we speak. So, so I'll support uh, annexing Station 19. Thank you, Jim. That's it. Any other any other board members have comments or questions? Okay, I don't hear any. Do I hear a motion? for the board to ratify the annexation of the session 19 property into Happy Valley. So moved. Chris moved. Dale second. Jay seconded. Ariel, please call the roll. Thomas. Yes. Chris. Yes. Jim. Uh, yes. Jay. Yes. Marilyn. Yes. Thank you, the board of directors, uh, the uh, passed unanimously. Our next item on the agenda is legislative update. Ms. Genova, nice to see you. We haven't seen you. I haven't seen you for a couple of months, so welcome. Good evening, and thank you so much. So um, not a lot to report because we are currently in campaign season, which is great for me. Um, because the Capitol building is technically closed, there's only one entrance open uh, to the building, so it makes it very difficult for us to get in to even see uh, the staff. But during campaign season, there are lots of calls coming my way, um, people wanting to know uh, what our issues are, what we care about, and it gives me an opportunity to visit with them about some of the things that Chief Brown and I have visited about, um, for example, um, maybe lessening obligations for certain development projects from the fire districts, things of that nature. And it's just much easier um, during campaign season to, to make those um, issues known. Uh, other than that, there is a firefighter capacity task force that I'm serving on. It meets about once a month. Um, I am so pleased that I work with Clackamas um, because there's been a lot of discussion about how uh, career firefighters um, work with volunteers, and I always look to Clackamas because I think they're the perfect example of um, just a really cooperative spirit. Um, working with the Volunteer Firefighters Association, sometimes I'll get calls from around the state uh, from volunteers indicating that they're not happy or they feel like they're um, not being treated properly, and I've never had a call like that in about 25 years. I've never had a call um, from a Clackamas volunteer firefighter. So I, I think you're doing it right. And I can lean on that experience with you as we go forward. And then I, I just wanted to close with, there's also a wildfire uh, public education task force that is being stood up by the Office of State Fire Marshal and your very own Jerry Carney is serving on that on behalf of the Volunteer Firefighters Association. So Love working with you. Continue. I uh, love the continued working relationship, and that's all I have. Unless there are questions. Thank you. Does anybody have a questions, comments to share to Genoa? Okay, Genoa. Thank you so very much, and good to see you. Uh, our next OB two is a board committee and liaison reports. Director Syringe and Director Wall. Do you have an update on? And Marilyn, thank you so much for stepping in while I was out of the country. Uh, please please let us have uh, any update from you. No one can substitute for you, Thomas. <laughs> you mean my pure English accent? <laughs> no, your tan. <laughs> oh, my tan. Chris, <laughs> earlier I told, I told Ariel and Marilyn, don't you see I have a perfect tan from Dubai? <laughs> Nobody appreciate that. Oscar, you can appreciate that. Yes, I know. Okay, Marilyn. <laughs> well, at the interagency committee meeting, we uh, discussed, of course, at length the Gladstone uh, contract that was just approved by the board. So there isn't anything to add to it. Um, we also discussed a potential of a proposal for the Aurora uh, Fire uh, Agency's uh, fleet maintenance and also a very rough draft 
of a uh, costing out for scuba work for Sandy. But those are both items are both still in um, the works, if you will. I don't know if Jim has anything else to add. No, nothing. Nick, do no. you have anything to add? Uh, the only thing that I would like to add to that was uh, two days ago. Well, geez, it wouldn't have been two days ago. It was Thursday. So uh, I received an official uh, request from the fire chief of Aurora uh, for uh, to, to bring something forward uh, with them. So that, that conversation with Aurora and fleet services should be um, uh, coming forward here uh, to the board uh, and still trying to figure out if the fire chief wants to get the IGA committees together. Um, but that's been a formal request to the fire district to provide them numbers for a IGA for fleet services. So okay. more to come there. Okay. Thank you, Nick. Director Jay, do you have any update, anything on foundation? Yeah, we met, uh, or they met on the 15th and I set in on it. Um, so, um, probably, I don't know if you've heard or not, but, uh, uh, Rachel Trotman is now uh, taking uh, over helping out them with some ad administrative work there. So she's able to do that from home uh, as she's taking care of her, uh, her family from, and helping out the foundation there um, with some of their administrative work, which is a great thing for everybody, it sounds like. Um, also, there's as of today, actually, um, the foundation still had uh, 10 applications pending from the wildfires. Uh, probably, they're probably all going to get approved. They just have to go through a process. But they're still uh, still being challenged with uh, even wildfire work still. Uh, and Jerry Carney's doing some strong work there trying to, uh, you know, get those, uh, get those people money that still need it moving forward. Uh, the uh, foundation looks like they're going to approve at least thirteen hundred dollars uh, for the um, Oregon City Elks Lodge to buy an AEDs. Um, that's uh, moving forward quickly, so that should happen uh, hopefully by the end of the month. Um, and then um, the uh, Clackamas Long Term Recovery Group um, is going to has applied for uh, twelve uh, some money for twelve different rebuilds. These are houses that were burned completely to the ground. And they lost all their property, and so uh, the foundation is looking at giving uh, fifteen hundred dollars each to up to 12, uh, 12 homes or families that are building their house from the ground up. Um, fifteen hundred is not a lot of money, but it, you know it helps out with furniture, gutters, or whatever they need to do. So um, that's what they've got in the works. So they're still doing a lot of busy work. They got a lot of st really strong work going on out there, and uh, and they're busy. Um, but that is pretty much. Uh, the extent of that last meeting. So um, there you go. Anybody have any questions for Jay? Okay. Um, I also want to really thank you for all the directors, your committee assignments and other, other responsibilities we do. I have a few uh, updates or announcements. Number one, uh, our executive committee is going to be meeting with the fire chief for the evaluation process Hopefully, we'll bring that to May board meeting. Uh, so we will details to be worked out with the executive committee and the chief, and we'll let you let you know next meeting. And another task force has been formed under the leadership of Jim Syringe, who, of course, you know our historian. Anywhere, anywhere you go, anything you do, that always reminds him of something. So we, we call, that is Jim Syringe for us. So under his leadership with a former a retired Chief Conrad Christensen, retired Assistant Chief Martin Governor, they and then will be evaluating and working with the Chief Brown, evaluating the history on a website and hoping to have that updated to everybody's satisfaction. And any of you who have been involved with the districts for a longer time, uh, please reach out to Jim and give your input and you can participate in that uh, updating of the history of the fire district. And uh, also our own director Haas is leading uh, the future funding task force. And he has been assisted with uh, uh, administration of officers and a representative from local 1159. 
Let me see. I think that's all the announcement that I have. Nick, did I, is there anything else? Yeah, if if we could uh, turn uh, uh, just a, a quick um, liaison update for civil service to Director Hawes. Oh, thank then, you. I, I missed that. And yeah. then after Director Hawes, if you would just turn just a little bit of time over to me so we could speak to uh, the hybrid meeting. Okay. Would be, would be great. Perfect. Under OB3 for me. Chris, I'm sorry. I missed uh, Missed. Oh, no worries, Thomas. Uh, last Wednesday, there was the uh, quarterly civil service meeting. Uh, we had a few minutes. Uh, Steve Steve Dieters was able to kind of give uh, a little bit of a background of himself because at the previous meeting, he was silly enough to have missed it and then got himself point, appointed chief examiner. Um, <laughs> so he got to kind of explain uh, his background and qualifications and stuff. Uh, the group reviewed and approved three different positions uh kind of qualifications testing procedures and i forgot to look out what those three were steve might know off the top of his head um the only other comment i would say is having watched it and, and thinking back of when i was when i was on there for my one meeting on the civil service board uh, it, it might be a good idea to kind of do a review for the older members and especially for the new, because we have Michael Morrow joined for his first meeting and Dr. Oh, I, it was just in my head and now it left. Um, but we have two new members and it would probably be a good thing to do a review of kind of what their roles and uh, process is and what, you know, kind of what they do. Because uh, I, I think there's kind of a little bit of an unknown of where uh, where their sandbox begins and ends, you know, as opposed to the board or the administration, that sort of thing. So it, it'd probably just be a good idea to, to kind of review that with everybody. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions if anybody has any. Thank you, Chris. Steve, do you have anything to update on that? Uh, no, it was uh, it was actually very very short and uneventful. The the three promotional processes were lieutenant, captain, and battalion chief that they approved. So, okay. Now, who is the who is the, the name we missed on the some doctor? Yeah, and once Chris added the the word doctor to the front, it left my mind. I <laughs> I can't I can't recall his name right now. But okay. I'll look it up. Okay, that's okay. Never mind. Okay, Nick, now you're back to you. Uh, that's awesome. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, last, uh, last month, the board uh, brought forward uh, the desire to uh, start meeting in person. And so the fire district has been diving into ORS um, and looking at equipment and trying to make that happen. Um, obviously, it was brought forward, I believe, last meeting, but in, in case it wasn't the ORS, uh, states that, that we have to provide means for uh, uh, our public meetings to be uh, a, a telecommute ability, a hy hybrid or online, whichever whichever version you decide to go. If we meet in person, we have to make sure that uh, people can watch the meeting from home. So no, understanding those parameters, staff uh, uh, reached out and, and started looking at the most cost effective equipment that we that we could do. Understanding that right now uh, where we're at, we are really looking at what we spend money on and, and having having the why behind it. And we got a couple of quotes. One was for $30,000, which we immediately said, no, we're not doing that. Um, the second quote was for $15,000. That didn't really sit very good in the appetite either. Um, and, and so what we have really landed on is a a version of the hybrid meeting that we can best see it. Uh, we, we have a, a new camera uh, that the uh, PIOs uh, are, are utilizing. Um, we test drove it with a all hands briefing in the organization with me, but we had some big time comms issues. So um, Ariel has been, has been researching and, and <coughs> trying to find the ability to uh, have our comms be fixed. And so the, the long and the short of it, um, and then I'll, I'll seek some guidance from the board on, on what we want to do. Um, the, the board would all be in person at station five, but none of the other panelists would be present. And, and in that way, we could see everybody. The way that the camera works, we, it doesn't have the zoom out func function to be able to capture all of us in the same room. So really, it would be able to zoom in to capture the five of you 
with your with your uh, the microphones, and uh, we would have to have a staff person there to make sure that the audio is working and that the camera is working appropriately. Um, again, it's really due to the limitations of the camera that we do have. Uh, each board member obviously will have a wireless microphone in front of them, and you'll have to press the button to talk, much like Gladstones. Uh, uh, if those that watch the city of Gladstones, they had a mute and unmute that it has that feature. We just received those uh, Friday and uh, staff was diving into them today. Um, we're trying to figure out how to hook those to the computer or if we have to buy a mixer worth it with it. So we're trying to test it out to see how, how it's going to work. Um, the Avid screen, which is at station five, if those that remember, it's that big computer looking TV, the big screen TV. Uh, we would have to have you all sitting where you normally sit. And then we'd have to will that, uh, that screen in front of you so that you could see panelists as, as they're doing their presentations, uh, any, any members from the public that need to come on and want to come on to speak. Um, and uh, again, that would be in front of you so that you could see each, each individual that's presenting. Um, Ariel's gonna have to be in a separate room. That way she can monitor the computer and communicate uh, when she's calling for roll and such. That way we eliminate the echo that's, that's caused by uh, the systems that we have. The long and the short of it, the, the system that we're gonna have to, to utilize to implement isn't the, isn't the best. We're, we're piecemealing something together until we can uh, figure out a long-term solution financially uh, and, and being able to really justify, justify putting in the, about $15,000 is what it looks like. Um, we've been researching GoPro cameras. Chris sent us, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's an eye basically, and it's a good camera. It's about a, it's about a thousand bucks. Um, but we're just trying to figure out if this is exactly what the board envisioned with, with getting together. Cause there, there's, uh, some staff behind the scene, that we're going to have to make sure we have one staff member up at station five with you, Ariel, offsite to make sure that everything's working as far as Zoom. And before we put this this plan in play, uh, we want to make sure that this is the guidance from the board, um, and that that the board understands fully what it's going to look like for the hybrid model for us at this time, until a later date where uh, we could we could figure out something almost like Gladstone's setup. But that's. I get, I'll get with the city administrator bets, but just piecemealing it and looking at the equipment that they had, that was right around the $15,000 quote that we got. Hello, directors. It's my opinion. Personally, I feel they have enough pressure with all the things that we are going on. We don't want to create undue pressure for, for the urgent, urgency for this hybrid meeting. Let's give them time and work through it. Uh, when it comes maybe two months or three months or whatever time, we, in time, we will get through that. Until then, we just have to um, work through the system with the zoo. But several, I want to hear some input from the fellow directors. Jay? Yeah, as much as I want to have live meetings, um, I'm not a big fan of patching things together and just making them work and forcing a square peg into a round hole. Yep. Um, so uh, I'd rather take... I'd rather Mark and Nick take the money that maybe they could allocate towards it this year and roll it into next year and put this, put us together something that's good. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're Clackamas Fire District 1. Let's act like Clackamas Fire District 1. Let's all patch this thing together and put uh, used tires on this thing. That's my opinion. Um, <laughs> that, so um, the, let's, uh, let's do it right. And so that's, that's my opinion. Even if it takes six months or a year let's do it right the exactly. OR, the, the, oh yeah the the Oregon law is not going to go away yeah so let's, let's do it right the first time and that way oscar and his people don't have to deal with it nick can wash his hands of it and it's done and mark can wash his hands of it and he doesn't have to go dig up a can of money every month to try to make this thing work that's my opinion jim so um i've been involved in some hybrid meetings and other uh avenues and venues that were really poor quality and it's so frustrating that it's not even worth it uh it's more frustrating than the so you we may as well continue this until you have the equipment and it takes good cameras and good microphones to make it and you almost need a producer off to the side 
you know, running it and that's just how it is. But I would, I would agree with Jay, get okay. the equipment when we're ready, bring it out, but it has to be. Thank you. Right. Jim. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. Chris. <clears throat> well, I guess I haven't looked, uh, you know, we did our last sunrise meeting in person using the, the camera. I think Nick's talking about, we, we call it the owl. I don't even know if it's that, because it kind of looks like a little owl. It has owl a, pros. I think what it's, what it's called. Yeah. And it, it basically is voice activated and it, it changes who it picks up by who's talking. So you sit around this little thing and it just wheels around and finds you. Uh, now, to be honest, I haven't looked at it uh, or looked at the video feed from outside the room, but I know we had at our last meeting, we had four of the members were in the room and three were, well, two were sick and one was out of town. So they were on the screen and it, it seemed to work pretty well. Um, and it's not terribly expensive. So I guess I, I, if anyone's curious, we're going to do it again next Wednesday night. Uh, this Wednesday night? Next the, 20, the 20th? I should know, uh, but I don't. I think okay, it's that's Wednesday. okay. Chris, um, let me ask you a question. Is there a public attends your meetings? They could. They they had the option, just like our other three members did, to to you know join by, by Zoom. Are you required by law, like we are, to open yes. to the it is? Yes. Okay. Okay. So but well, thank you. Marilyn. Well, I agree with those that have said that, um, you know, it's been two years, what's the rush? Um, we want to do it right, get the right system at the right price, because um, we have responsibilities, not just to keep the correct public records, but to be prudent with the money that the public gives us. So I'd say when the chief says he's got the right thing available for the right price, then that'll be the time. Nick. You heard the comments from everybody, so we are all in agreement. So yes. take your time and do that. And now, Chief, would you give an update from the office of the fire chief? I would love to. Uh, just on side note, real quick, Chris, would you send send me the link? Uh, I'd like to see what it, what what the camera looks like in action for next Wednesday. Thank you. I will. I'll do that. Yeah, and Chris, I just sent you an email, but yeah, if you do the same for me, I'd love that as well. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Now, I'm just going to preface this by Chief Mulek is going to get frustrated with me here in a second because I'm going to steal one of his talking points here uh, just because it's it's just super stoked and impressed by it. But before we get there, just I want to highlight a couple things that's going on in the organization. Um, one of the commitments we've made coming in is we're going to really afford facing community front uh, from Clackamas Fire District. We, we have done that in the past, but really looking looking out and, and getting face-to-face -face with communities as often as we can. And so um, uh, community services, along with government affairs, they've been preparing for uh, a content for wildfire preparedness month in May um, and preparing for some town hall meetings that will be held at our fire stations in collaboration with the county and disaster management. Um, this was built off of the success that we had in the fire district last year, if you all remember with the town hall meetings that we had at station 11, station 10 and station 18. Those were, we got a lot of positive feedback and they were well attended and the county is asked to partner with us moving forward with that. And so a lot of work going on with community services on the backside uh, with, with that and, and super, super stoked and, and proud of, of the crew, of everybody and what they're doing there. Um, one more thing to add is just, again, I'm hitting on that community services front now that COVID has started to, um, a community has started to, to open up and, and we've been able to get into schools and such. Um, uh, staff taught about uh, 337 students hands-only CPR, which is phenomenal, um, and about 45 adults. And then uh, staff presented fire and life safety to about 70 preschool students. So it's really awesome for us to be able to get back into the schools and, and start that front. Um, and then uh, crews responded to a, uh, a, a, a townhome fire with two units involved in a third uh, uh, fire extended to a third. And it was a, uh, there were two story um, uh, townhouses. This was a C shift, I believe. 
uh, crews ro rolled up and they had fire showing on the backside of the structure across three units. And, and the thing that, that I want to point out here is the time from when they arrived to extinguishment, um, 14 minutes. I remember when I was a firefighter uh, coming into the, to the fire district, uh, any apartment that we had, uh, we, it was 60 minutes, if not longer, uh, before we would call fire under control. And to have fire under control in 14 minutes in, a, in occupancies that big with that much fire spread, it just shows the, uh, the culture that exists uh, as far as extinguishment uh, that we have in this organization. And so uh, with that, I'm going to uh, defer the rest of my time. Uh, and I kind of hit a little bit, Thomas, on, on the PIO's piece so we can bypass Brandon's piece, uh, especially since he's, he's homesick tonight. Oh. oh, I thought Trish was going to step in. Okay, good. That's it. Okay. Uh, Office of Strategic Services, Assistant Chief Brian. Yeah, thank you, uh, <clears throat> President Joseph. So this evening, just a couple things because Oscar is going to speak, but uh, just a shout out to logistics uh, for, for a moment. A couple of weeks ago, we had a munis issue, which wasn't on our side of things, but it prohibited the downloading of essentially orders, whether it was for uh, fleet or, or things that stations needed and were expecting in their morning delivery. Uh, so the logistics crew uh, on a Friday uh, figured out the solution. They, uh, they called each of the stations, uh, figured out what they needed and got the deliveries done that day. Um, just, I thought it was tremendous internal customer service. Uh, it's just the, the, it epitomizes the way they approach their jobs. Uh, they care about the crews, they care about the, the, the community members that we serve uh, and they just kill it every day. Uh, and then also uh, the fire chief touched on wildfire uh, messaging preparedness. Uh, support services fleet is working on the wildland uh, preparedness as well, getting rigs together, getting those uh, sorted out and, and reassigned, making sure we're set to go. A uh, couple pieces, uh, the, uh, and Dan, I, unless you're going to cover it, the, the crew buggies are now Clackamas Fire Red. Um, they look fantastic. Those got wrapped in vinyl. Uh, it was a, uh, a cheaper option of getting those to, uh, to look like us uh, for the lifespan of those rigs. And then also the uh, another piece to to shout out to uh, BC Brent Olson and uh, finance manager uh, oh shoot uh, Michael Wong uh, they worked on getting a an amendment request through with FEMA for some uh, remaining funds from a previous AFG grant uh, so we're going to be able to ramp up some wildland fire training, but also purchase uh, some much needed uh, BK uh, mobile radios uh, with those funds. So uh, the, the pair of them really knocked that out of the park. Uh, and those are probably the big pieces I've got for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Does any of the directors have a questions or comments for Brian? Okay. Hearing none. Thank you. The chief technology officer, Hicks. Good evening, uh, Mr. President and members of the board. Uh, first, I'd like to commend Chief Brown on his other hat he was wearing as a chief technology officer explaining the whole uh, audio <laughs> vision. I was impressed. I was impressed. I was like, man, I got to go find a job now. Um, <laughs> no, it's, it's been a while. Um, some of the highlights we have going on in the technology services division. Um, we got our Panasonic tablets out. Um, the ESO platform so far has been successful. I you know, anticipated it to, it to continue to be successful. Um, we updated some domain controllers. So one of the things we've done now that we've um, truly migrated over to the Office 365 is updated our domain controllers, which is gonna help us uh, in scenarios. Uh, for example, like with uh, the vote we just passed, you know, adding the, you know, the Gladstone uh, logins, uh, devices to be able to log into our environment via the, the net motion in the CAD. So that's gonna make that a lot easier. Uh, we got some uh, research and testing going on with Windows 11. Kicking and screaming, but we know it's coming because Windows 10 is gonna be gone pretty soon and we just got it. Um, another big thing is some of the budget processes. I've actually have learned, learned a lot of things and I got some highlights out of there is, you recall back in February of last year, we, um, deployed um, Cradle Point branch solutions uh, to station 12 and 13. 
And that was to reduce the telecommunications, uh, some of the telecommunications costs. Uh, we were paying a Silver Star Telecom for Clear Creek and Beaver Creek Telco for uh, T1 lines. And that was at 1.5 megs. Well, we're able with the cradle point, that was a tradition with Silver Star, that was like 57K a year. We're now paying 1500 a year for cradle point branch routers, and they have 1.2 gig of network speed. That's wow. a significant difference yeah. um, just, in those, just in those two stations because of those telcos, because they weren't able to get the county broadband. And so even though it's not the 10 gig we have at other stations, but it's a whole lot faster than 1.5 meg <laughs> at those two stations. Um, so I was kind of excited about that, just, one of those nuggets I found is going through the budget process. My other highlight is uh, with COVID, one of the, what I call a win is, as I've been preaching to Brian and Nick about my mobile workforce. And I think COVID has shown us it can work. It does work. And so just part of the budget process is looking at more of those desktop as a service type options where we could uh, mobilize more of our workforce and look at some lease options to reduce kind of that initial capital uh, cost. Um, cybersecurity. I know there's a new wave of cybersecurity, you no know, phishing and, and emails coming out there, especially with what's going on in Ukraine and Russia, but uh, we're still being diligent on that. Uh, they, st they still get through every now and then, but I, I would ask that when you guys see something that's suspicious, it probably is. So <laughs> let's not click on it. Um, any questions anyone has of me, I'd be glad to answer. Any other directors? No? Yeah, thank you, Oscar. Nice to see you. Same to you, sir. Thank you. Office of Business Services Assistant Chief, Steve Dieters. Uh, thank you, Director Thomas. Just uh, one quick update before I turn it over to Human Capital Manager, Trish Noble, who will kind of give you a recap of what's going on there for the last month. Uh, we did get back last Thursday, the technical review for the feasibility study between Clackamas Fire and Sandy Fire. Uh, took the weekend to kind of glance through it and then Chief McKinnon and I met this morning to kind of go over together some of the things that we found. Uh, and then Chief Snyder has some input as well. And uh, we'll be meeting uh, Wednesday to hopefully finalize and get a final one, one document of edits sent to them uh, by the end of the week and then hopefully start to get the draft back. Uh, but just a little update on the feasibility study. Uh, so with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. If not, we can turn it over to uh, Trish Noble. Any questions for Assistant Chief? Okay, Trish Noble, welcome. Hello, good evening, everybody. It's nice to see all your faces. So I've got just a few points for you tonight, um, highlighting what's been going on in the human capital realm. Um, so our crew 30, wildfire hand crew, the temp labor pool has returned back to the district. Um, they began back April 4th on mass. And then two weeks before that, the new crew boss uh, came to study under the outgoing crew boss. So we have nine returning members from last year and 16 new. So a total of 25 wildfire hand crew um, members who will be with us somewhere till around the end of September, depending on how the wildfire season goes. Uh, for laterals, we had 10 offers go out, and following tonight's uh, decision that you folks made on Gladstone, we're going to be letting them know shortly that they're looking at a mid-May uh, academy. So I know they're going to be excited about that. We have about half of them through the process of finishing up their screenings. Um, and so as they wrap that up, they're going to be allowed to put their uh, notice in with their current employers, who I'm sure will be sad to be losing them but we're glad that we're gonna be getting them here. So that's great news. Um, this last week, entry-level interviews went, took place, and this was an interesting um, new process because a platform was used called Spark Hire Now. This is the first time the district has used this. Um, and um, if you want more information about it, I'm sure Chief Dieters could give that to you uh, based because he was part of that process. But basically what happened is the, um, 
entry level candidates had to pre record their responses to interview questions and then the panel members were allowed to see those uh, messages in individual uh, groupings of these folks to see and um, apparently the process went very smoothly so we think that that will save in time and efficiencies and money going forward but that also it seemed to be a good process so Steve would you concur on that uh, yes I would and um, just for everyone's uh, kind of basic knowledge of it, it we still do a process we still have a panel in a room the candidates submitted their best work. We we gave them uh, a time frame of which to complete their interview. We gave them the six questions. Uh, they submit what they feel is their best. And then we sat down and we interviewed uh, 111 people in two days with three panels. Uh, the nice thing about Spark Hire and people submitting their uh, interviews is that there's no downtime, there's no introductions, there's no reading the question each time. For anybody that's been on a, a panel before, it gets kind of draining and monotonous. Uh, we had 278 apply, and if I'm correct, I think we sent out 140, 148, I believe, passed all of the entry level stuff to, to receive an interview, and 111 actually. Uh, sent one in. So those scores are being uh, tallied right now. Another change to our process was uh, traditionally we would score at the end of the day or as the, uh, the uh, interviews were done, but I wanted to collect all the information and have a few days in between so that then we can start scoring with a, a clean slate, a clear head and, and all of that and make sure that we don't make any uh, mistakes mathematically with anybody. So uh, that is sort of how we've done the, the spark hire. And uh, it was for those that participated, it would, we've got nothing but great feedback about how it went. So I think it was a success and it was a one year subscription. So we'll be able to use it for a few times before we have to decide whether we want to subscribe to it again or not. Happy to answer any questions. Chris, you have anything more to update? The only other piece I was going to add is the change up that we're going to be doing with check ins with all of our paid staff. So um, shortly, we're just wrapping up the last pieces on our job form changes and what we're going to be doing moving forward. This past year, people were checking in with their um, the supervisors, with their employees four times a year based on four different topics. And we're going to be um, streamlining that down to two check-ins a year and what those two check-ins are going to be focusing on. And, and if you're curious why we did that, this, that was based on feedback from many people over the last year saying what they thought was beneficial, what was too much, which topics were good, which seemed maybe just check in a box. So uh, during those two check-ins during the year, we're going to have folks setting uh, SMART goals. The next follow-up check-in would be checking in on the progress of those SMART goals. And then additionally, it's going to provide this really holistic 360 approach for feedback um, in the district. So and uh, supervisors can check in with their employees and say, how are you as an employee? Um, what are you bringing to the table here at your crew? But also, what input do you as an employee of the district want to give for how your crew is doing, uh, your division is doing, and the district as a whole? And those pieces are going to be collected and then make it up the chain of command so that the chief officers and managerial staff can take a look at that. So that's a, that's actually going to be a significant change over what we're doing in the past year. That's it for me, unless anybody has any questions. Any directors have questions? Okay. Trish, I have a question. When you compile all this information, does any of the staff request to hear the final version of that? You mean what we're going to be doing for the change ahead? Have they requested that? Uh-huh. Um, well, I we won't know, I guess, until we launch this, but I can tell you it's meant to be for the district to see. It's not just going to be kept spirited away for only certain groups. It's it's nice that we're using JotForm now. JotForm actually acts as a mini database and captures all of this. So we can very quickly break out um, what that information is. It's almost like a suggestion box in yeah. a formatter. But the great thing about this, 
remember that fabulous survey we did years ago? <laughs> no more of that. People's names will be tied to this. So there's going to be have that accountability with it as well. Good. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Okay, hearing none, let's move on to CFO on the financial update, sir. Uh, thank you, Thomas. Good evening, everybody. Again, um, just uh, a couple quick updates. Um, first of all, the, the finance report for the month is on, on page 49 of your, your packet, um, if, if you'd like to give that a look. Um, but beyond that, I just have a couple, a couple updates. First, just talking about the, the current year budget. Um, just to summarize what, what most of you probably already know, right? We, we, the original budget was passed with a $1.4 million deficit. Um, roughly midway through the year, we projected that that could grow up to $3.6 million deficit if we didn't take action. Um, and unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to include it in, in the packet, but I'm currently forecasting that by the end of the year, we'll have that at about a, a $2.1 million deficit. Um, so, so an improvement um, over, uh, definitely over where we were trending, um, but still most likely needing to rely on some contingency in a, in a supplemental budget to, to, to get back in line. Um, that said, of course, our, our goal and, and what we will achieve is, is to pass a, a, a balanced budget um, next fiscal year. Um, and so related to that, um, we did receive uh, this month of uh, the county's forecast for assessed value growth next fiscal year. And they recommend um, a range of three to three and a half percent NAV growth. Um, so what you will see uh, for what we'll propose in next year's budget um, is an estimated AV growth of 3.25%. Um, for perspective, you know, we've traditionally forecasted a, at AV growth at 4% to 4.25%. Um, so this is about a, a $450,000 reduction um, annually if compared to a 4% growth or a close to $600,000 reduction compared to 4.25% growth. Um, so that, that is a significant hit to what we might have been expecting and planning on. Um, and we're working on the proposed budget right now. Um, but we will still plan to submit a, um, a balanced budget. Um, you know, this, this revenue hit just means we won't be able to fund as many of the things as we might like. Um, but it also speaks to the importance of the mid-year reductions that we made this winter and spring, um, which are allowing us to absorb this reduction um, without scrambling to find additional cuts or, or other drastic measures. Um, we're gonna be able to balance the budget um, with, without having to, to do additional cuts. Um, and so that's, that's the good news um, as, as to where we at as to where we're at. Um, but I think it's also a good reminder that, you know, we're, we're coming out of a deep hole um, and the recovery, you know, may be slow. There may be bumps along the way like this one, um, but that's, that's what we're working towards. So um, I think those are my two, two big updates on, on where we're at financially and happy to take any, any questions if there are any. Directors, any questions? Wow, my goodness, Mark, you are really educating us good. We don't have any confusion. So uh, Office of the Emergency Services Division Chiefs, Josh Santos and Dan Mulek. Josh, is he here? Yeah, good evening. I'll, I'll speak for Josh tonight. He's unable to attend. Okay, um, thanks, Dan. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, Josh just wanted to throw out real quick that Amy Jo is, uh, is presenting at the National Drug Abuse and Heroin Summit in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, she's there this week alongside with the Milwaukee Police Chief. Uh, Luke Strait and April Heron from Clackamas Public Health, and they're presenting on Project Hope. Um, once again, just a uh, another great, great bit of work by uh, by Amy Jo and uh, and everything that she's done. Um, on the operations update, I'll just uh, real quick just hit uh, Chief Stewart, thanking you for uh, mentioning the uh, wildland preparedness uh, and, and getting the rigs ready. If anybody remembers the forecast for last Monday's commute that said a chance of snow. Uh, our crews ran those wildland rigs in four wheel drive with chains on them in somewhere between six and eight inches of snow, depending on where they were in the district. So um, it, was a, it was a pretty crazy morning uh, for the organization. Um, last board meeting, uh, Director Searing uh, had a question and, uh, and, and voiced some concern over our mutual aid 
uh, with, uh, with some of our partners. And I just want to take the opportunity right now, since everybody's in the room, to ex explain uh, how, how we look at mutual aid and how the system works in the, in the charts that you're seeing in the board reports and, uh, and what the data actually means. So uh, Clackamas Fire, we're at, we, we have uh, eight different borders. Uh, we have anywhere from the city of Portland, city of Gresham, which are very busy agencies, uh, to Colton Fire Malala can be in some agencies that are a lot more rural. We dictate our borders and um, our and our response uh, delays that we that we put into the equation for asking for mutual aid. With the city of Portland, since Engine 20, Engine 25 is right next door, and we have companies that are very close proximity as well. Um, we put delays on that border so that we can pretty much manage our own calls for the most part and not have to rely on them crossing the county line. Um, Clackamas Fire is big enough that we can, we can support this, the first, second, and a lot of times the third due call before we actually need mutual aid. So our borders are set up for that. Um, the problem with that is that when we set up one border, it does the entire border of Clackamas Fire. So our rural agencies that are to the south of us that, uh, that are willing to provide mutual aid, our run cards that we have set up as Clackamas Fire do not allow them to come over and, and be able to, to donate to that mutual aid as, as, much, as, uh, as much as one would think. So uh, there is intent uh, for them to come into our fire district and help it. We kind of control that border. And so that's why you see that we don't go into some of our neighboring uh, jurisdictions very often. Uh, I do want to point out in the board packet that we utilize Canby Fire in this example, that, uh, that Canby Fire is very willing to come in. And in fact, uh, they, they have come in and you look at the report uh, for fires and, and transports and uh, in rehab as well. And times where the mutual aid agreement really comes into play and we utilize them and we very much appreciate it. You'll also notice on the, on the report, that 75% of the calls that we uh, respond to in the uh, city of Canby uh, are recalled. So um, it's, it's really interesting that it's their run cards dictate us going that direction, but they have a unit that comes available that they can manage. If you break it all down, this year we've seen a drastic decrease uh, with our, the number of mutual aids going into Canby. We're trending right now at about having 72 total for the year with still 75% of those anticipated being recalls. So we are working with our partners uh, on that balance. I understand that's very important uh, for a board of directors to, to understand that we, we're putting a focus on serving our community and then helping the other communities when they, when they ask for it. And, uh, and also what's reasonable and what type of emergency are we gonna go um, vacate our FMZ to go help them. So that is a balance. That's where the relationships, the pre-planning and the, uh, the, the run cards come in. Uh, I'll just leave it with the, uh, I was on one of the, uh, selected on a committee with the uh, Fire Defense Board to help edit our, our, the Clackamas County Fire Defense Board mutual aid agreement. And so I'm, I'm very in tune with those conversations and, how, and what the intent of that uh, agreement is and that we're doing our best as operations to, uh, to manage that appropriately and create balance. So um, hopefully that just kind of gives a quick summary of, of how we do business when you're looking at the information. Um, we are, Ariel and I were speaking today about better ways to provide the information in graphs so that it's uh, interpreted clear and uh, so that we give you just a great picture of what the fire district is doing. And so we will work on that balance to help provide with accurate information in the future. Any questions on that? Jay? Director Cross. So um, you guys have all heard me say this for many years now, and I'm going to say it again. Run numbers tell us nothing. Um, run numbers and uh, averages are just things that you throw out to elected officials so that it makes it uh, look like you're throwing numbers out there. What really tells the story is unit minutes and unit seconds. Um, and uh, 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 although run numbers are pretty and you can put graphs to them and you can make it look nice, uh, it does not tell any story at all. And so to really get down to the nitty gritty, you wanna know how many seconds we are out of service responding into any given districts. And you wanna know how many seconds they're responding into our area giving us service. That's what tells the, tells the story of actual 
work that's being done. Now, I know that that's a big lift to do every month, and I wouldn't expect that to be done every month, but it would be nice that like on an annual report or something on some sort of regular basis that we could actually see how many seconds station engine 301 is running calls and how many seconds uh, station um, 14 is spending in Gresham and Sandy and how many seconds Sandy and Gresham are spending in Clackamas Fire District 1 um, compared to that stuff. So um, that tells a story. Um, so, but once again, I know that talking to Shelby in the past, that's way too big of a lift to do every month, but it would be nice come budget season that we see where, what our resources are doing, but numbers like this, they're just pretty colors on a piece of paper. Jay, do you see at the bottom of page 48, the monthly uh, average? It's not down to seconds, but it's down to how many hours of utilization minutes and the percentage of the month utilized for the company. Right. right. Uh, and you know what? One of the things I appreciate too, uh, and I know I understand this has a lot to do with dispatch, the huge delay that we have between BOAC, CECOM, and getting mutual aid from, from, from Multnomah County and from Multnomah County getting mutual aid from, from Clackamas Fire specifically because of the huge delay in dispatch. And I know that that's why you've had to make some of the changes in your um, responses just because you just don't know how long it's gonna take to get engine 20 or engine 71 into Clackamas Fire. And I totally get that. That's a, that's a, a conversation for another day, but um, uh, anyway, like I said, I think this is a really good, I, I, I think your presentation was really good in talking about how you've had to pull back so that Clackamas Fire can take care of our own business, which I totally appreciate. But, uh, um, but that is, um, um, and this is, this is good stuff, but it, like I said, it would be nice to have an annual report that really breaks it down. Um, anyway, I'll leave it at that. Anybody else? Okay, hearing none. Uh, Treasurer Chris James will provide a local 1159 update. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the board. Uh, my name is Chris James. I'm the uh, treasurer of local 1159. I'm also a AO medic assigned to the Pleasant Valley Station 7 on B shift. A couple things for you. First off, congrats to both uh, AO Hinkle and firefighter or a Fiji on their birth of their new babies. And we also have a couple members from the local and from the D1 unit going to IFF peer support training and a few others going to leadership classes in June. The Oregon State Firefighter Council, which uh, represents 3,700 professional firefighters here in Oregon, uh, recently applied for an $8 million federal apprenticeship grant as well as a, a recruiter position for the apprentice program, which is also a federal grant. Uh, the D shift committee continues to make some progress and uh, recently bringing in data services to help with uh, tele staff implementation and trying to see how that's all going to fit together. That's all I have for you tonight, unless there's any questions. More than happy to answer them. Thank you, Chris. Anyone? Any questions? Okay. Thank you so much. For your update. Nice to see you. You know, volunteer association is not the interim president, he is the permanent president and president of this association. Ever since I came on the board, he has been maybe not quite all the time. So, my pleasure to introduce President, president Kearney. Update on a volunteer association. You are muted, Jerry. You can tell how unimpressive I am. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President and members of the board. Uh, I'd like to give you the station coverage first. It's uh, the station 12 was 31 out of 30, 31, excuse me. Station 13 was 24 out of 31. And station 21 was 19 in-house nights out of 31. And with regard to the uh, at-home response for rehab, we had uh, every night of the month covered from at home or in the station. Um, the uh, drill topics for the month, <clears throat> and I got a little education on this today. 
for something called a Nance drill, which is a firefighter rescue through a collapse to ceiling, or excuse me, collapse floor or roof, I'm told. Uh, that, that terminology was not used when I was uh, uh, falling through roofs and floors back in the 60s. Um, also, uh, the another topic was rig to door. Uh, what when when you pull up? What are you going to bring with you into the fire, into the building? Uh, what's necessary? There was a firefighter survival rig with a down firefighter and firefighter assessment when he is down or she is down. Uh, brief initial reports and ICS. And EMS was respiratory. I'd like to just point out to you that with uh, the coverage that I mentioned, we have eight firefighters who have been hired. We have two firefighters who are on leave of absence for uh, their paramedic program, and two more firefighters who are uh, on personal leaves. So the remaining core group of about 30, I believe, uh, really had to pull hard uh, to make those numbers, and I want to congratulate them for it. Other than that, I have uh, nothing more to give you. Thank you so Thank much, you. President Thank Kearney. You. Anybody have any questions or comments for Jerry? But Thank you, Jerry, for your presentation. And Full of directors or the correspondence and informational items are included in your package. Our next board of directors meeting will be on Monday, May 16th, 5 p.m. by remote video conferencing. The board of directors meeting is now adjourned at 6.51 p.m. And good night to all. Bye, everyone. Have a good night. Thanks, everybody. Good night, everybody. Thank you.